in the Cook Report. This girl smuggled heroin and was caught. But she's a pawn in a much bigger game. Tonight, how the CIA encouraged and profited from much of the world's trade in hard drugs. Thailand, the Golden Triangle, heroin center of the world. And in the middle, the man they call the Prince of Death. Khun Sar is literally a jungle warlord. His 15,000 strong army fights for the independence of Shan province. But he's better known as the largest supplier of heroin on earth. Through his hands pass 2,200 tons of opium a year. The opium is refined into more than 300 tons of heroin. White China heroin, as it's called, is the purest of all. This is the raw material from which the drug is made. And you don't have to be an addict to suffer. How easy it is to be caught up in this deadly business was brought home last month to two families in Birmingham. Good, very good. The RMB News at 6, this is Nicole Pullman. Two teenage girls from the West Midlands are under arrest for allegedly trying to smuggle 40 kilograms of heroin out of Thailand from Bangkok. Patricia Carhill from West Heath is 17. Karen Smith from Solihull is 19. Police say they found more than 30 kilograms, half a hundredweight of heroin, in their suitcases. The heroin, now sealed in evidence bags, was hidden in sweet tins and shampoo bottles. The size of the hall was staggering. The drugs the girls are accused of carrying have a street value of more than six million pounds. Patricia's parents, Patrick and Francis, say the girls weren't at all wary of the strange cargo they'd been asked to carry back to London. Well, according to Patricia, there was... Well, she wasn't suspicious or anything like that, but she checked out the can of sweets. It was just a normal can of sweets to her when she shook it. It was just sealed. She didn't want to open it up. Do you believe that's the case? I mean, were they really that naive? Well, I don't know what to believe. I mean, I'm not a 17-year-old child. So is it possible she got into this for money, or do you think she was set up? Well, I'd say Patricia was definitely set up from... Um, I'm not sure which end it looks like the people maybe she had she seemed to get to know in Birmingham um, whoever this Adrian fellow was uh, seemed to have had an awful lot to do with it as they set off to see their daughter in Bangkok juvenile remand center Adrian is the name that keeps recurring Patricia must know Adrian's identity but so far she's not talking Mother and father hope that things will go easier for Patricia if she can be persuaded to talk. The police want details of how the girl's trip was arranged and why. You know, as we go in, you'll see Patricia come from somewhere to us. For the Thai police, the fight against heroin never ends. They spend more resources on combating the drug trade here than on almost anything else. They destroy what they can, but this soil is made for the opium poppy. And the police are up against a well-organized network, which gets the opium from the fields to the refineries and out of the country, and pays the obligatory bribes along the way. When the Thai police recently carried out a world record heroin bust, they seized a ton of the stuff. Khun Sa's heroin, mostly. But where in such a poor country did the money come from to set him up in business? At 
Hobart's Bangkok docks, that ton of heroin was destined for the United States. Here in America, nobody has spoken out more forcefully on the evils of drugs than the president himself. It's almost a crusade. But in that crusade, the warlord from the Golden Triangle, Kung Sa, may prove to be a major embarrassment. It's becoming increasingly clear that the Central Intelligence Agency, and remember, George Bush used to be its director, has encouraged and profited from drugs dealing on a massive scale if it suited their wider political objectives. The administration has effectively admitted that this was the case with General Noriega of Panama, now awaiting trial for running a drug trafficking operation which he says was originally set up by the CIA, on whose payroll Noriega was for years. Now there's Kunsa, the charge that the CIA turned him into heroin's Mr. Big. As the US Army fought the Vietnam War, the CIA ran private anti-communist wars in neighboring Laos and Cambodia. The Khun Sa story first emerged when some people began to ask how the CIA could spend ten times more money on its covert operations than its budget allowed. But most likely it was coming from uh, the drug trade that was uh, being run by the CIA uh, um, assets in Southeast Asia and some of the profits of which were going to the CIA in order to run uh, its own operations uh, uh, against the communist forces. On what do you base this? Had there been, for example, a long-running connection with warlords, drug Oh, battles? yes, yes. We were involved with people like Hung Sa from way back in, um, in the 50s and a number of other uh, warlord drug dealer types uh, in uh, Laos and other areas. Um, these, this is the way these people made their living. They were assets of the CIA for operational purposes. Kung Sa's concern is the eight million Shan people who live in an area the size of Switzerland. And while the Central Intelligence Agency was helping itself to drug profits, it was also helping Kung Sa to make them. The general claims the army he was able to build up not only protects the opium trade, but more importantly, protects the Shan people from a Burmese government bent on stamping out their independence movement, which itself dates from a promise made under a treaty signed in 1947, but never kept. The Shan have either been fighting or preparing to fight ever since. The people who grow the poppies pay a tax on their produce to Kung Sa. That's how well organized the business is. His soldiers protect that business and the primitive looking but efficiently run distribution system that deposited a ton of heroin at Bangkok docks and half a hundredweight in Karen Smith and Patricia Carhill's suitcases. In Bangkok, a first court appearance for Karen Smith. Time for a whispered word with a prison guard. The story, as the girls tell it, is that the man called Adrian in Birmingham gave them two club class air tickets costing £2,400 each. The tickets were routed from London via Holland and Thailand to the Gambia in West Africa and then back to London. The girls say they thought they were going on holiday. But it was the suspicious routing of their tickets that alerted customs. I'll try this afternoon, but if not, I'll be there first thing in the morning. Pardon? Eric Smith tries to talk to his daughter, Karen. At 19, she's the older of the two girls. For parents and investigators, the same question arises. If Adrian gave them the air tickets in Britain, who gave them the heroin in Thailand? Who did he say he was? Who did he say he was? The white powder the girls were carrying is tested in batches, and every test so far has proved positive. It's also known that in Thailand, they went to Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai is Thailand's second city 
and a first port of call for drug smugglers because of its close proximity to the Burmese border. At the Rinkham Hotel, where Patricia and Karen stayed, the police say they've been unable to discover who they met or what they did. So we too went to Chiang Mai, where the heroin trails out of the Golden Triangle converge. We were going the other way to meet heroin's Mr. Big, an unauthorized trek 10 miles inside the Burmese border to Kunsar's military stronghold. The journey will take 24 gruelling hours, dodging the border patrols as we go. Along narrow tracks, across 34 streams and rivers, and over six mountain peaks. From Tiger Camp, General Kun Sa presides over an army of 15,000 men and 80% of the world's heroin trade. And since he came to Shan province, opium production is estimated to have increased three or four fold. It's not three or four fold, it's much more than that. How can you justify being involved in this trade, bearing in mind the awful consequences for the end user? The traders come in with the opium and we tax them. We have to tax them so that we can generate the money for the troops to defend ourselves. And there's another factor. The people have to survive, and the way things are, cultivating poppies is the only way they can make a living. The general seems to be regarded by his people as a kind of savior. His taxes raise nearly a hundred million dollars a year. A large part of this goes to support and equip his army. He doesn't surround himself with the luxury trappings normally associated with big-time drug dealers, but sizable sums do seem to have been spent on improving the quality of life of the Shan people. He's proud of the fact that he's provided better homes, hospitals and many schools like this one, where previously there were none. So how do you feel now that you are being criticized for doing something that suited the Americans? They wanted an anti-communist army, you had one. They wanted money from drugs, you policed the business here. In this case, we are the losers. To survive, we have been forced to build up a business we don't want. The Americans encouraged us. I don't want the revenue from opium. I want for my people the revenue from new, legitimate business. I want the outside world to help us build new business. But Kunsar's offer to end the opium trade has fallen on deaf ears. Even if they believed he was sincere, no government would want to deal in public with someone as despicable as a drug baron even one with pretensions to benevolence. So, to protect himself and his people, Kun Sa recruits young men to serve in his army. The general invited us to inspect 1,400 new recruits and cadets. Children as young as 12 come to Tiger Camp from all over Shan province to be educated before joining the ranks of his army at 16. But Kun Sa dismisses the ultimate consequences of his evil trade and the American government has no sympathy. The U.S. Attorney General has indicted him on drug charges. Patricia Carhill's parents go to visit her at the Juvenile Remand Center. It's their last visit before they must return home. In the courtyard, it's early morning exercises, rather regimented to Western eyes. Patricia stands alone, behind bars and behind a language barrier. 
This is the kind of institutional life she's facing, unless she can prove to the court she was an innocent dupe. The only people who can help are Adrian, who gave her the tickets, and Adrian's Chinese friend, who gave her the drugs. But guilty or innocent, she's still a victim of the worldwide trade in heroin. The awful effects of this awful business keep being felt. What would you say, General, to the mothers of two young British girls who were arrested while being couriers for the drug? What do you say to the parents of children who died from addiction? What's your message to them? I know heroin is an evil drug. I pity the one who is addicted and I feel great sorrow for the people in prison because of smuggling. Those two British girls are very young. But those convicted of smuggling are lured by money. And my people need money too. And I must feel pity for them and try to help their plight. What I really want is for the world to help to drag the drug out by the root and get it out of this area forever. One man who believes that Kun Sa, though wrong to trade in drugs, is right to criticize the Americans, is a much decorated American hero himself. The allegations of CIA involvement began with Bo Gritz and a phone call from the top. I received a call from the National Security Council saying that George Bush had it on good authority that General Kun Sa, overlord of the Golden Triangle, had five American prisoners of war and sightings on 70 more. And they wanted to know if I could get into the Golden Triangle. The bottom line is, as far as I know, I was the first U.S. government agent ever to go into the Golden Triangle, see Kun Sa in his inner sanctum, and come out alive. And he told me, I want you on videotape, he said, to take a message back to President Reagan. Tell him I'll eradicate the opium from the Golden Triangle. Tell him that I'll also reveal every U.S. government official who has been my best customer for more than 20 years. You found no prisoners, but what were you told to do with the information you did bring back? I was told to erase and forget all that I had gathered from the Golden Triangle. And more than that, I was told that if I did not, I would serve 15 years as a felon. Inside the Golden Triangle, the opium producers and smugglers keep arriving at Kunsar's control points. At Tiger Camp, the tax office is the newest building. But the CIA dealt in vastly larger sums than passed through here. To use that money to fund their covert operations, they had to sever its connections with the drug trade by filtering it into the banking system, preferably not on their own doorstep. It was here in Sydney that the operation to launder the heroin money was based. Many millions of dollars were channeled through an office at 55 Macquarie Street, then occupied by the Nugan Hand Bank. This bizarre bank collapsed in 1980, following the mysterious suicide of one of its founders. Seven years after it was set up, largely on behalf of the CIA, to process the profits of drug trafficking and to pay for covert arms deals on a massive scale. After investigating that money laundering, John Dowd, now the New South Wales Attorney General, has no doubt about the CIA Kunsa connection. Well, I went north of Chiang Mai into the area of the hills where the poppies were grown. I saw the fields. It is an area controlled by Kunsa, both that, that part of Thailand and Burma and the southern part of China. Uh, he runs the whole area there and ran it then and uh, obviously was involved in the distribution and payment of these people for the opium they grew. And you believe him when he says he was encouraged to grow more by CIA officials and that he actually supplied CIA officials with considerable quantities of heroin? Well, I, I believe that the CIA would, would buy and support the growing. I don't know that he would receive money uh, that he would pay money to CIA officials, but that may be just a naivete on my part. But obviously he was paid directly or indirectly by the CIA uh, to keep this trade going. 
The secret of what really happened is locked inside the CIA's headquarters just outside Washington, D.C., and the CIA isn't talking. So what kind of men take unaccountable decisions to go well beyond the law? They're absolutists. They become completely dedicated to the objective of their mission to the point where they don't have any regard for the means that are necessary to achieve it. And they will use any means necessary now, in their mind, to vanquish communists. And they will use political assassination, blackmail, extortion, a bribery, anything to achieve their means. And when they no longer got adequate support from their people and their legislatures, they established this bond with narcotics traffickers around the world who move in that same kind of nefarious world with them to provide funding for these criminal operations. And these are the men now, over these years, who have become primarily responsible for instigating this massive epidemic of hard narcotics, of heroin and cocaine, in Britain, in the United States, and in Europe. That's who these men are. Hippie Street, Bangkok, where two worlds meet. Drugs from the Golden Triangle and potential couriers to carry them onward. Young tourists, short of money and down on their luck, are easy prey for drug dealers looking for paid runners. Patricia, whose trial date will be set soon, was, it seems, recruited for money too, according to a rather frightened young lady in Birmingham who almost went in Karen's place. Patricia came to me and asked me if we'd like to go to Thailand. And I asked her why she was going there. And she hesitated. And in the end, she did tell me what she was going over there for, and it was for drugs. But, you know, I said no straight away. And she asked Karen, and Karen was sort of only an anari. And in the end, she went. But I, she didn't really want to go. What was in it for them? Well, to my knowledge, Patricia told me that she would be getting £3,000. So would Karen. And what were they expected to do? Smuggle them into Britain, or...? Yeah, they were going to smuggle them into Britain. So I wasn't aware of any, any of that going on at all. But does that surprise you? Well, not really. Knowing the type of people that they're dealing with. There could be an element of fear in it on Patricia's side. I don't know. I think Karen agreed just to appease a friend more than anything. But I don't think she realised anything like this was ever going to happen. Had she ever been in trouble before? No. Never. So, now knowing a little more, what do you feel about Adrian now? Well, my feelings towards Adrian is that um, I hope I don't come face to face with him. Because I dare say I lose complete control. And it'll probably be me they're locking up, not him. The Dome nightclub in Birmingham, where Patricia met Adrian a local businessman known to the police as a target criminal. Adrian hasn't been seen for some time, and the hunt for him goes on. So too does the heroin trade, according to Kunsar, thanks to the CIA. 